Upon his departure in 1942, General Douglas MacArthur had pledged to liberate the Philippines, and in particular, its capital, Manila. This goal drove General MacArthur's decision-making throughout the war and influenced the U.S.'s strategy for dismantling Japan's empire in the Pacific. After his arrival in Australia, General MacArthur served as the supreme commander of Allied forces in the Southwest Pacific area. For MacArthur, a swift return to the Philippines was paramount. His campaign emerged as one of two Allied offensives against the Japanese Empire. The other, Admiral Chester Nimitz's Central Pacific Campaign, advanced toward Okinawa. By August 1944, MacArthur's forces had largely completed the New Guinea Campaign and were poised to strike the Philippines. Guerrillas identified enemy positions, watched the Japanese, watched their movements and encampments, and drew maps. These intelligence data were sent to MacArthur's command in Australia, and this greatly helped in planning MacArthur's return to the Philippines. General MacArthur's plan for liberating the Philippines centered on the island of Luzon. To shape the operation, 6th Army landed on Leyte in October 1944. Here, 6th Army liberated the island and afforded itself an avenue through which to support its advance. On Leyte, 6th Army gained invaluable experience that would help it in subsequent operations. For the Japanese, the defeat on Leyte jeopardized their ability to defend Luzon. With Leyte under 6th Army control, MacArthur turned his attention to the island of Mindoro. The retaking of Mindoro enabled U.S. fighters and bombers to harass Japanese forces across Luzon. Combined with carrier-based aircraft, a newly constructed airfield on Mindoro meant MacArthur's planned invasion at Lingayen Gulf had ample air support. To forestall the collapse of the empire, the Japanese developed the Sho Plan in May 1944. The plan envisioned the Philippines as the site of a decisive air, land, and naval confrontation against advancing Allied forces. The Imperial Japanese Army dispatched General Tomoyuki Yamashita to the Philippines to organize the archipelago's defense. Yamashita had distinguished himself in combat in 1941, earning him the moniker, the Tiger of Malaya. Yet, he found himself out of favor with Prime Minister Hideki Tojo and relegated to a garrison command in Manchuria until 1944. The end of Tojo's prime ministership in July of that year and the U.S.'s successful campaigns across the Pacific meant a shot at redemption. He took command of the Japanese 14th Area Army and began preparing it for a decisive confrontation with U.S. forces. Upon his arrival in September, General Yamashita quickly recognized the dire situation facing his army. The Philippine economy had been wrecked under Japanese occupation, and with the bulk of rice harvests going to Japan, his forces lacked sufficient food, equipment, and supplies. Moreover, Filipino guerrillas ran rampant with attacks against collaborators and Japanese troops. Yamashita faced the daunting task of maintaining Japanese control over the island while also defending it from the impending Allied invasion. The best he could do to meet the show plan's intent was to stymie an American invasion through attrition. The fight for Leyte had drained General Yamashita's command of irreplaceable soldiers, further straining his ability to confront the well-resourced U.S. forces. Consequently, the 14th Area Army adopted the Rusan Jikyu Saksen Kekaku, or Luzon Strategic Plan for Attrition. To maximize his remaining assets, General Yamashita divided his forces on Luzon into three groups, Shobu, Shimbu, and Kembu. Yamashita himself commanded the Shobu group. Its 152,000 troops defended the northern area around Baguio. Under Major General Rikichi Tsukara, the Kembu group, with its 30,000 troops, covered Luzon from Clark Field south through Bataan and Corregidor. Lieutenant General Shizo Yokoyama commanded the 80,000 troops of the Shimbu Group, which defended the area surrounding Manila and south toward the Bicol Peninsula. 
Each group controlled mountainous terrain upon which General Yamashita planned to attrit U.S. forces on Luzon. General Yamashita recognized his forces could neither defend Manila nor provide for its inhabitants. For him, destroying the bridges and making the harbor unusable would render Manila strategically useless to the Americans. Yamashita intended for his army to abandon Manila after removing supplies and demolishing infrastructure. He tasked Major General Takashi Kobayashi with overseeing the evacuation. Kobayashi would eventually withdraw his troops to an area north of Manila, leaving behind the Noguchi Detachment. Thereafter, General Kobayashi commanded the Kobayashi Force. The Imperial Navy, however, had different plans. Thanks to a command structure that promoted rivalry between the Army and Navy, the commander of the Naval Garrison in Manila, Rear Admiral Sanji Iwabuchi, operated outside of General Yamashita's control. Through Navy channels, he obtained authorization to defend Manila. Yamashita ultimately relented and granted the Admiral command of the 4,500 soldiers who remained in Manila. These troops, in addition to the 13,500 sailors and Marines of the Manila Naval Defense Force, began preparing the city for 6th Army's arrival. General MacArthur believed his troops would be welcomed as liberators and the Japanese would likely abandon Manila to avert its destruction, much as he did in 1942 by declaring it an open city. Admiral Iwabuchi had no such intentions in 1945. Like General Yamashita, Rear Admiral Iwabuchi had fallen out of favor after the battleship he commanded, the Karishima, was sunk by the USS Washington at Guadalcanal on 15 November 1942. Iwabuchi anticipated his stalwart defense of Manila would restore his honor. In the decades before the Second World War, American imperialism had transformed Manila. Wide, tree-lined boulevards, large federal-style government buildings, and a baseball stadium gave the city an American look. Despite this influence, old Spanish fortifications and churches, as well as traditional Filipino dwellings, filled out the city. American engineers and architects had made infrastructure investments, which resulted in new federal buildings structurally engineered to withstand earthquakes. The Manila Naval Defense Force turned these buildings into strong points and the boulevards into a maze of choke points. Defenders bricked up doors and windows, cut firing slits into walls, sandbagged roofs, and constructed pillboxes throughout Manila. Japanese troops also dug tunnels to connect fighting positions across the city. The vast network of tunnels, which included the sewer system, housed armories and generators. The Japanese incorporation of tunnels into their defensive plan demonstrates one of the signature challenges associated with urban operations. When thoroughly reconnoitered and controlled, Subsurface areas offer excellent covered and concealed lines of communication for moving supplies and evacuating casualties. They also offer a means for caching and stockpiling weapons and munitions. Subsurface areas may include subways, mines, tunnels, sewers, drainage systems, cellars, civil defense shelters, and other underground utility systems. Subsurface areas are used to gain surprise, to maneuver against the rear and flanks of an enemy, and to conduct ambushes. The Japanese also conducted extensive counter-mobility operations by barricading streets and laying mines to disrupt maneuver and separate mounted from dismounted forces. To compensate for insufficient weapons and munitions, they also fashioned improvised landmines from aircraft bombs and depth charges. Japanese salvage crews also removed anti-aircraft and naval guns from the half-submerged ships in Manila Bay and emplaced the weapons in pillboxes and strong points across the city. Guarding the Pasig River as it entered Manila Bay, the Spanish fortress of Intramuros sat in the heart of Manila. Effectively a city within a city, this massive complex served as the core of Rear Admiral Iwabuchi's defense. With stone walls over seven meters tall and more than 12 meters thick at the base, the 16th century fortress remained formidable. 
even to the U.S. Army in 1945. To develop their defensive course of action, the Manila Naval Defense Force had to assess the urban landscape and determine how best to use it against the attacking 6th Army. Preparation is a key characteristic of the defense. Defending forces study the terrain, enemy forces, and prepare engagement areas. An engagement area is a location where the commander intends to contain and destroy an enemy force with the massed effects of all available weapons and supporting systems. In the defense, commanders shape the enemy approach and steer formations into engagement areas. Obstacles in the urban defense can analyze, interrupt, and delay enemy maneuver, giving the defender a significant advantage. Separating dismounted forces from mounted forces disrupts the attacker's cohesion and reduces combat power. It also exposes the attacker to defeat in detail, as a friendly combined arms element can effectively counterattack the leading enemy dismounted force while leaving the enemy armored force vulnerable to anti-armor attack by dismounted troops. The Japanese anticipated an American attack from the south, not the north. Iwabuchi surmised the Kembu and Shobu groups would thwart any U.S. advance from the north. He established a series of defensive strong points in southern Manila known as the Genko Line. The Genko Line provided defense in depth that stretched from the Manila Polo Club to Nichols Field to Mabatu Point with Fort William McKinley to the northeast. The line consisted of makeshift minefields made up of aerial bombs and depth charges, as well as 1,200 pillboxes and numerous anti-aircraft and naval guns used as field artillery. With its mutually supported strong points and battle positions, the Genko line possessed the depth necessary to stall even the best equipped forces. Another characteristic of the defense, operations in depth is the simultaneous application of combat power throughout an area of operations. Operations in depth disrupt enemy long-range fires, sustainment, and command and control, and prevent enemy forces from maintaining their tempo. Mutual support exists when positions and units support each other by direct and indirect fires preventing an enemy force from attacking one position without being subjected to fire from one or more adjacent positions. Mutual support increases the strength of all defensive positions, prevents defeat in detail, and helps prevent enemy infiltration between positions. Despite these preparations south of Manila, Iwabuchi was not ready for the overwhelming U.S. advance from the north. On 9 January 1945, General Yamashita looked out across the Lingayan Gulf from the top Santo Tomas Mountain. Instead of being greeted by much needed supply ships, the U.S. Navy's 7th Fleet stretched across the horizon. That morning, the U.S. Navy bombarded the beaches of Lingayan Gulf. The primary Japanese resistance came from above as kamikazes attacked the larger U.S. naval vessels. Although harrowing, this allowed the 148 landing craft transporting the lead elements of 6th Army to land largely unopposed. Major General Oscar W. Griswold and his 14th Corps were first ashore. 6th Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Walter Kruger, landed between the towns of Sual and Santo Tomas. Without much fight, 6th Army secured the towns of Lingayen and San Fabian to establish a lodgment. As they penetrated inland, 6th Army gradually encountered stiffening Japanese resistance. General Kruger's operational approach for Luzon centered on clearing the island's central plains north of Manila. But to do this, he needed to secure his eastern flank from the Shobu group. Clearing and holding the central plains would afford 6th Army the rear area necessary to support future operations in Manila. Unlike General MacArthur, Kruger envisioned the Japanese defending the city. By 24 January, 
The 14th Corps' two divisions, the 37th and 40th, had advanced toward Clark Field and Fort Stotzenberg. These locations sat roughly halfway between the Lingayen Gulf and Manila. During the advance, Kruger's forces engaged elements of the Kembu Group for the first time. The Kembu Group slowed 6th Army's progress, which troubled General MacArthur. For him, General Kruger's operational approach was overly cautious and lacked the tempo necessary to prevent the Japanese from turning the campaign into a battle of attrition. MacArthur exercised considerable pressure on Kruger to expedite 6th Army's pace. He even placed his headquarters closer to the front than Kruger's own command post. Manila mattered most to General MacArthur. The plight of American prisoners of war held in Manila made liberating the city a priority for him. MacArthur and his staff knew of the suffering of POWs at the hands of their Japanese captors. Many of the POWs were veterans of Bataan and Corregidor. The Japanese massacre of U.S. soldiers during the 1942 Bataan Death March weighed heavily on the American mind, and especially on MacArthur. Fearing the imminent return of U.S. forces, the Japanese 14th Area Army massacred 139 American POWs on the island of Palawan. While advancing, U.S. soldiers and Filipino guerrillas liberated emaciated POWs from Cabanatuan, further underscoring General MacArthur's rationale for reaching Manila quickly. Thankfully, conditions favored a change of tempo. On 27 January, the 1st Cavalry Division arrived in theater and soon joined 14th Corps. 11th Corps executed a landing at Subic Bay on Bataan on 29 January, which relieved forces occupying Clark Field. 14th Corps also pushed elements of the Kembu Group farther west of Fort Stotzenberg, freeing one of its divisions for the attack south. On 30 January, General Kruger hastened 6th Army's pace and tasked 14th Corps with a rapid advance on Manila. In turn, two columns from the 1st Cavalry Division left an assembly area just north of Cabanatuan for Manila. The lead column was built around the 2nd Squadron 8th Cavalry. 2nd Squadron 5th Cavalry served as the nucleus of the other column. In addition to the Cavalry Squadron, each column included a medium tank company, a 105 mm howitzer battery, and transport. The 148th Infantry Regiment, 37th Infantry Division, departed the area near Clark Field and followed close behind. Objectives included rescuing POWs confined at Santo Tomas University in Belibid Prison, as well as securing Malacanang Palace and the Legislative Building. The university, prison, and palace sat in northern Manila above the Pasig River. The legislative building was located south of the river. U.S. forces also attacked from the south to prevent the Shimbu Group from reinforcing the Manila Naval Defense Force. Two regiments from the 11th Airborne Division executed amphibious landings near the town of Nasugbu on 31 January. This placed the 11th Airborne approximately 88 kilometers southwest of Manila. As the two regiments advanced, the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment joined them after executing an airborne operation on Tagatai Ridge. Upon reaching Manila, these units operated under 6th Army. From the north, the 1st Cavalry Division's columns surprised Japanese troops on the outskirts of Manila. On 3 February, they arrived at Grace Park on the city's northern edge. The 1st Cavalry Division's lead column then pressed on to Santo Tomas University. After defeating the Japanese guards, the U.S. soldiers liberated 3,500 civilian captives. The next day, the 37th Infantry Division's 148th Infantry Regiment liberated 465 civilians and 810 POWs from the nearby Bilibid prison. Soldiers of the 1st Cavalry Division's 1st Column secured Malacanang Palace, but the legislative building still sat well beyond reach. 
1st Cavalry Division's order to secure these sites highlights the importance of controlling essential buildings, infrastructure, and locations during urban operations. Many urban areas are too large to be completely occupied or effectively controlled without an enormous force. Therefore, commanders should focus their efforts on controlling only the essentials to mission accomplishment. At a minimum, this requires control of key terrain. In an urban environment, commanders determine key terrain based on its functional, political, economic, or social significance. The 1st Cavalry Division's columns arrived before the Manila Naval Defense Force completed its preparations north of the Pasig River. The sudden shift of 14th Corps from fighting the Kembu Group near Clark Field to a rapid advance on Manila caught the Japanese defenders off guard and unprepared. To stall the Americans, Iwabuchi ordered the wholesale destruction of buildings and infrastructure. As the 1st Cavalry and 37th Infantry Divisions entered the city, Japanese troops began laying waste to the area north of the Pasig. Admiral Iwabuchi ordered the destruction of electrical and water utilities. His troops detonated aircraft bombs and gasoline barrels which consumed entire neighborhoods. The fires destroyed some of Manila's oldest cultural institutions and gutted its commercial district. The 14th Corps commander, Lieutenant General Oscar Griswold noted, a lot of this destruction is wanton and of no military purpose. The Manila Naval Defense Force also began the systematic massacre of civilians. As U.S. troops liberated Santo Tomas University, Japanese soldiers rounded up suspected Filipino guerrillas in the city's Tondo district. By evening, Japanese soldiers had beheaded approximately 20 men. The slaughter continued as they bound and bayoneted women and children, leaving the bodies of 19 women and 27 children in a vacant lot. Some survived, and their testimony later helped U.S. Army war crime investigations. The Manila Naval Defense Force's actions ensured the city descended into the depths of barbarity before the battle had even begun. Having achieved three of its four objectives, 14th Corps began clearing Manila north of the Pasig River. With the 37th Infantry Division as the main effort, the Corps advanced south. Finally, on 5 February, they reached the Pasig River, but Japanese forces had destroyed the last remaining bridge over this vital waterway. Meanwhile, the 1st Cavalry Division conducted a flanking maneuver east through the suburbs, but was soon redirected to secure a critical water treatment facility farther north. Then, the 1st Cavalry Division attacked west toward Manila Bay in an effort to block the Japanese withdrawal. Despite securing several of their intermediate objectives, the U.S. forces' rapid advance did not last. MacArthur had expected to be greeted by an open city and its grateful residents. He had visions of a victory parade down one of Manila's boulevards. Upon realizing a battle, not a parade, would transpire, 6th Army rapidly adapted to the urban fight at hand. Covering over 36 square kilometers and with approximately 1,100,000 people living in the area encompassing Manila, General Kruger's staff recognized the challenges posed by the city's sheer size. They prioritized securing the city's water and electrical infrastructure. 6th Army tasked 14th Corps with securing these nodes, isolating the Japanese garrison, and preventing any force from relieving the defenders. Understanding that encirclement was the best course of action, 6th Army planned to attack from north to south toward the Pasig River. By 5 February, the 11th Airborne reached Manila and confronted the Genko Line. The 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment slowly cleared the enemy's defenses. The sheer number of enemy naval guns caused one company commander to remark that the Navy should stop looking for the Japanese fleet. It's dug in on Nichols Field. The fight through northern Manila, although difficult, 
did not seriously hamper 14th Corps' progress. Japanese destruction of all six bridges presented a challenge, but failed to delay the Corps. On 7 February, the 37th Infantry Division made an amphibious crossing of the Pasig River while under fire. They soon established a bridgehead approximately 150 meters deep on the south bank of the river. By the next morning, engineers finished construction on a pontoon bridge, which enabled an entire infantry regiment and two battalions to occupy positions on the south bank. By 9 February, the 1st Cavalry Division had secured the city's primary water facilities, crossed the river at two points, and quickly advanced into the city center. On the evening of 10 February, the 37th Infantry Division cleared Northern Manila of Japanese resistance. Elements of the 37th Infantry Division then crossed the Pasig and moved west. The rapid U.S. advance stunned the Japanese. With U.S. soldiers already across the Pasig and others attacking the Genko Line, Iwabuchi relocated his headquarters to Fort McKinley. MacArthur feared excessive close air support and artillery fire would endanger the lives of civilians and destroy the critical infrastructure necessary for restoring essential services after combat. Consequently, elements of the 37th Infantry Division began their thrust into the heart of Manila with only limited air and artillery support. Effective combined arms operations in urban areas require adjusting tactics, techniques, and procedures to ensure units can support each other without causing excessive harm to the populace or damaging critical infrastructure. Artillery fire in urban areas must be closely coordinated and planned in detail to include considerations of munitions effects, the psychological effects on the populace, and potential collateral damage. Because of its steep angle of descent, high angle fire can achieve greater effects and is usually the preferred method of fire in urban operations. High angle fire is fire delivered at elevations greater than the elevation of maximum range of the gun and ammunition concerned. However, range decreases as the angle of elevation increases. Urban operations often demand more detailed and restrictive rules of engagement and a greater number of protected sites require restrictive fire support coordination measures. A fire support coordination measure is a measure employed by commanders to facilitate the rapid engagement of targets and simultaneously provide safeguards for friendly forces. Fire support coordination measures can be either permissive or restrictive in nature. Permissive fire support coordination measures are the coordinated fire line, the Fire Support Coordination Line, or FSCL, the Free Fire Area, and the Kill Box. Restrictive Fire Support Coordination Measures are the No Fire Area, Restrictive Fire Area, and the Restrictive Fire Line. Additionally, airspace coordinating measures can ensure that other missions, such as air reconnaissance and attack aviation, can transit or operate in the airspace above and around the urban area. For air-delivered munitions, terminal control and guidance can help ensure the delivering platform has acquired the correct target, thereby reducing the risk of fratricide and collateral damage. A crucial part of Manila's public works sat on Provisor Island in the Pasig River. The 37th Infantry Division deemed securing the electrical plant on the tiny island as vital to avoiding power outages in the city. The division tasked the 129th Infantry Regiment with conducting an amphibious assault to seize this critical node of the power grid. Elements of the Manila Naval Defense Force had established fighting positions within the power plant complex. Even before the 129th's amphibious assault, the Japanese destroyed critical power generation equipment. Three days of intense fighting left the power station in complete ruin. The 129th Infantry suffered considerable losses on the island, with 45 dead and 96 wounded, revealing the risks involved with conducting an amphibious assault without adequate indirect fire and close air support. South of the now liberated Provisor Island, the 148th Infantry Regiment engaged Japanese defenders in the heavily fortified Paco Railroad Station. 
The U.S. soldiers overcame the Japanese pillboxes and crew served weapons outside the station and fighting positions within before securing the strong point. Despite the rules of engagement and attempts by U.S. forces to mitigate damage, the ongoing fighting was destroying Manila. The rules of engagement changed once aerial reconnaissance revealed that the Japanese had fortified almost every major structure in the city. Sixth Army, therefore, gave up any notion of saving the city's buildings. Saving American soldiers now took precedence. When the 148th Infantry Regiment landed at Lingayan Gulf, its total strength included 3,268 soldiers. After crossing the Pasig River, the 148th encountered fierce Japanese resistance that left the unit at only 85% strength. With casualties mounting and replacements in short supply, the 37th Infantry Division commander worried that he would bleed his unit dry before liberating the city. He received permission from 6th Army to modify the rules of engagement and use more permissive fire support coordination measures. The combination of greater artillery fire and armor support aided the infantry in capturing several enemy strong points. The Japanese defenders did not give up. The new police station required eight days of intense bombardment and four infantry assaults before falling to the 129th Infantry Regiment. For the civilian inhabitants of Manila, artillery barrages were just one of many terrors they experienced. When the Japanese first arrived in 1942, they spoke of Asian unity. Claims of including the Philippines in the so-called Asian co-prosperity sphere, however, resulted in Japan's looting of rice and their second-class treatment of Filipinos. The Filipinos resisted in every way they can. Many Filipinos went up to the hills to become guerrillas. It is estimated that there were a quarter of a million guerrillas during the war, and around a tenth of them were female guerrillas. In some areas, the guerrillas were so strong, the Japanese feared going into their territories. With their empire shrinking and the threat of defeat imminent, Japanese mistreatment of Filipinos intensified. The Battle of Manila is all about massacres. There were many orders found which outlined how to destroy the city, how to blow up bridges, how to fight the enemy. But perhaps the most chilling of all these orders are these two. First is the Kobayashi Group Order dated February 13th. The Americans have penetrated Manila with about 1,000 troops and there are several thousand guerrillas. Even women and children have become guerrillas. All the people on the battlefield, with the exception of Japanese military personnel and Japanese civilians, will be put to death. The Manila Naval Defense Force Battalion Order Number 1200. When Filipinos are to be killed, they must be gathered into one place and disposed of with the consideration that ammunition and manpower must not be used to excess. Because the disposal of bodies is a troublesome task, they should be gathered into houses which are scheduled to be burned or demolished. In southern Manila, Japanese troops hunted down unarmed civilians. The well-built concrete homes of Manila's elite afforded displaced persons safety from artillery fire. But as civilians congregated in these homes, they drew Japanese attention. On 10 February, Japanese troops massacred 100 civilians at the home of a local businessman. On 12 February, Japanese soldiers murdered 28 civilians at another residence. The next day, they killed 100 civilians at yet another home. As the battle raged, groups of Japanese soldiers massacred civilians at sites across the city. As General MacArthur and his troops fought to liberate Manila and stop these atrocities, they realized they needed to adjust their plan to account for what current army doctrine describes as a mass atrocity response operation. A mass atrocity refers to widespread and often systematic acts of violence against civilians by state or non-state armed groups, including killing or causing serious bodily or mental harm. Genocide is a form of mass atrocity and refers to acts committed to destroy a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. 
Civilians are often deliberately targeted to inflict terror, reduce popular will to continue a struggle, punish an adversary, deter or compel civilian behavior, or achieve other objectives. In these circumstances, army units may have to defend vulnerable civilians, defeat enemies that perpetrate mass atrocities, and perform stability tasks to address the root causes of mass atrocities. Commanders can employ any combination of seven general approaches when conducting mass atrocity response operations. An area security approach utilizes mobile patrols, quick reaction forces, and outposts to secure a widely dispersed victim population. A shape clear, hold, build approach uses mobile forces to clear areas while static forces maintain security. This approach is suitable when victim populations are concentrated and perpetrators possess a strong base of support and considerable military capabilities. Separation is used to establish a buffer zone between perpetrators and victims. It is similar to a traditional peacekeeping mission and may result in long-term division between belligerents. Safe areas are established to protect concentrated victim populations, such as at internally displaced persons camps. This approach cedes territory to perpetrators and may also require significant humanitarian assistance. Under a partner-enabling approach, the preponderance of ground forces are drawn from a host nation or multinational coalition, and U.S. forces provide security force assistance and logistical support. This approach minimizes the U.S. footprint and helps build host nation capacity. Containment relies on air, maritime, cyber, and special operations forces to prevent a threat force from committing mass atrocities. This approach is often integrated with diplomatic and informational efforts and offers a limited means of protecting victims. Containment is more of a deterrent and often a precursor to other approaches. During large-scale combat operations, commanders may have to adopt an offensive focus to defeat perpetrators and destroy their military capabilities. This approach requires a large ground combat force and is usually accompanied by extensive reconstruction and stabilization efforts. With Rear Admiral Iwabuchi's forces still occupying much of Manila, south of the river, the best course of action for General MacArthur to prevent further atrocities was to isolate and destroy the last remaining Japanese strongpoints. As the fight raged at Nichols Field and U.S. troops moved into position at the Philippine General Hospital, the 1st Cavalry Division advanced to the waters of Manila Bay. On 12 February, the division linked up with the 11th Airborne Division and completed the encirclement of the Manila Naval Defense Force. After elements of the 11th Airborne captured Nichols Field on 13 February, the 1st Cavalry Division continued its clearing operations. Resistance stiffened as 14th Corps advanced farther south into the city. Troops fought block by block and building by building against Japanese defenders who often refused to surrender. The clearing of the Pasai district was typical of engagements that occurred all across the city. Over a period of two days, the 12th Cavalry Regiment and the 2nd Squadron of the 5th Cavalry Regiment fought their way north on Vito Cruz Street in the vicinity of Harrison Park, LaSalle University, and Rizal Memorial Baseball Stadium. The units engaged several heavily fortified Japanese strongpoints. On 15 February, 12th Cavalry conducted preparation fire against the heavily defended LaSalle University for over an hour before clearing it. After clearing the university, 12th Cavalry moved on to Harrison Park and Rizal Memorial Baseball Stadium. The concrete structures and clear fields of fire made Harrison and Rizal costly objectives for the Americans. Between 15 and 18 February, 12th Cavalry cleared Harrison Park and nearby Fort Abad leaving the baseball stadium to 5th Cavalry. A surreal scene then unfolded when, instead of baseball teams, U.S. soldiers and three of 5th Cavalry's Sherman tanks took the field to battle Japanese defenders, 
holed up in the dugouts and entrenched on the diamond. The fight for Harrison Park, LaSalle University, and Rizal Memorial Baseball Stadium cost the 1st Cavalry Division 40 dead and 315 wounded. Meanwhile, the 129th and 145th Infantry Regiments secured the new police station. Similarly, the 148th attacked the Japanese positions in the Philippine General Hospital. The 148th encountered intense fire from basement fighting positions. They were also continually harassed by enemy fire from upper level windows and rooftops. On the first day, the 148th Infantry suffered 22 killed in action and 29 wounded. Although initially reluctant to fire on a hospital, the presence of Japanese fortifications confirmed the target as legitimate and 14th Corps authorized indirect fire support. Consequently, the 140th Field Artillery Battalion fired over 2,000 high explosive rounds in the vicinity of the Japanese held hospital, while the 82nd Chemical Mortar Battalion fired over 1,000 high explosive mortar rounds and hundreds of white phosphorus rounds. The 1st Cavalry then occupied attack positions south of the hospital in preparation for the pending assault. Simultaneously, the 145th Infantry continued its attack against the main hospital buildings with only meager gains. On 16 February, the 148th Infantry learned that civilians remained inside the hospital complex, which prompted an immediate change of tactics. Up to this point, the regiment had used point-blank direct fire from tanks, tank destroyers, and self-propelled guns to blast breach points into the walls of fortified buildings. Having identified civilians in the hospital complex, the regiment abandoned this practice and instead relied entirely on its infantry to gain access to the buildings. On 17 February, the 148th methodically advanced its support by fire and assault elements to ensure they maintained mutual support while avoiding excessive collateral damage and civilian casualties. The unit's progress was hindered by the need to evacuate a constant stream of civilians on the battlefield. Although it was slow, the 148th Infantry controlled two of the hospital's four wings and two other buildings in the complex by the end of the day. In sum, the regiment evacuated nearly 7,000 civilians. The 148th then turned its attention to consolidating gains, with its troops engaging pockets of resistance until they were relieved by the 1st Cavalry. 6th Army had broken the Genko Line. The collapse of the Genko Line caused Rear Admiral Iwabuchi to relocate his headquarters from Fort McKinley to Intramuros. This action coincided with an effort by the Shimbu Group to break the encirclement for possible escape by the Manila Naval Defense Force. Between 15 and 18 February, the Shimbu Group's 31st Infantry Regiment, 8th Infantry Division, and two provisional infantry battalions sought to cross the Marikina River from the north and seize the Novaleches Dam. Simultaneously, the Kobayashi Force attempted to capture the Balara water filters before linking up with the northern prong. Piecemeal Japanese attacks over the next three days all failed to disrupt 14th Corps' plans and relieve elements of the Manila Naval Defense Force. The battle raged across Manila. 14th Corps' fights for City Hall and the General Post Office required sustained artillery fire to defeat the 200 Japanese defenders. On 20 February, the 145th Infantry Regiment used a battery of 105mm howitzers and a single 155mm howitzer to blast a hole in the east wall of City Hall. A platoon then attempted to exploit the gap, but Japanese resistance halted their advance. On 21 February, artillery fire destroyed more of the east wall, yet another infantry assault failed to establish a foothold inside the building. The following day, 22 February, U.S. forces employed direct artillery fire and point-blank tank fire at the building's east side, upper levels, and roof. With such close fire support, maneuver units were finally able to gain entry to the building. The Japanese defenders isolated themselves on the first floor and refused to surrender. 
U.S. soldiers made holes in the second floor and used flamethrowers to incinerate the occupants below. Only then did resistance cease. The fight for the general post office proved even more difficult. The five-story, earthquake-proof building, with its compartmentalized interior, proved nearly impervious to indirect fire. Even if a 155 millimeter round penetrated a window, the blast did relatively minor damage. Three days of intense artillery fire and numerous assaults by the 145th Infantry Regiment made no headway. Finally, on 22 February, 1st Battalion gained access through a second story window. After entering the building, the U.S. forces isolated Japanese troops in the basement. Although the General Post Office overlooked the northeastern approaches to Intramuros and a tunnel linked the two locations, the Japanese defenders received few reinforcements. At this point in the battle, the Manila Naval Defense Force could only fight with what it had. As the battle dragged on south of the Pasig River, 14th Corps began consolidating gains in areas under American control. With the local government in shambles and the city largely destroyed, 14th Corps alone had the ability to provide relief for the city's inhabitants. What followed was the initial phase of the Corps' effort to consolidate gains and restore order to Manila. Operations to consolidate gains are activities to make enduring any temporary operational success and to set the conditions for a sustainable security environment, allowing for a transition of control to other legitimate authorities. Early and effective consolidation activities are a form of exploitation performed while other operations are ongoing, and they enable the achievement of lasting favorable outcomes in the shortest time span. While Army forces consolidate gains throughout an operation, consolidating gains becomes the overall focus of Army forces after large-scale combat has concluded, and can therefore be considered a mechanism for transitioning from offensive operations to stability operations. Consolidation of gains activities consist of security and stability tasks, and will likely involve combat against bypassed enemy forces and remnants of defeated units. Units may initially conduct only minimum essential stability tasks and then transition into a more deliberate execution of stability tasks once security improves. Units in the close area involved in close combat do not consolidate gains. Instead, divisions and corps assign either a brigade combat team or a division respectively to consolidate gains in the rear area. When consolidating gains, 6th Army divided the city into eight districts based on its natural and man-made features. As maneuver elements fought the remaining Japanese defenders, 6th Army attached Philippine Civil Affairs units to 14th Corps in liberated city districts. U.S. soldiers and Filipino nationals served together in these units. A typical unit included 10 officers and 39 enlisted soldiers trained for specific roles. These civil affairs units organized food distribution, medical care, sanitation, shelter, and the recruitment of labor for dislocated civilians. Additionally, these units provided care for the former prisoners of Santo Tomas University. According to Army doctrine, there are two minimum essential stability tasks that are conducted during the initial phases of operations to consolidate gains. First, units establish civil security to protect the population from violence and restore public order. Second, Army forces provide for the immediate needs of the populace, ensuring access to food, water, shelter, and emergency medical treatment. While units are legally responsible for ensuring the protection and well-being of civilian populations, they are not required to perform these tasks if an appropriate host nation or civilian relief organization is available. Using host nation personnel to provide essential services and humanitarian aid can be an important first step in rebuilding the public's confidence and trust 
in the host nation government. Restoring order to Manila required providing civil security and distributing relief supplies. Division and Corps Provost Marshals and Supply Officers worked to accomplish both. Obtaining supplies during an ongoing battle required an extensive logistics network and detailed planning to balance the demand for fuel and ammunition against the need for food and medical supplies. Furthermore, the destruction of rail lines by the Japanese before the invasion, the shipwrecks littering Manila Bay, and the damaged port facilities meant all supply shipments had to be disembarked at San Fabian. From there, trucks completed the 193-kilometer journey to northern Manila and deposited relief supplies in warehouses administered by the 6th Army Civil Affairs Section. This section also began the process of restoring public services and utilities. To address the scarcity of potable water, it established water distribution points throughout the city. Whenever possible, civil affairs units received assistance from combat troops. Together, these units began restoring basic essential services and alleviated suffering in the city, while fighting continued just south of the Pasig River. The liberation of Manila hinged on seizing Intramuros. The massive complex dominated the region where Manila Bay and the Pasig River met. The city fortress abutted the Pasig River to the north, with the river serving as a formidable defensive obstacle. When the 37th Infantry Division reached the opposite side of the river in early February, it directed fire against targets of opportunity in and around Intramuros' north wall. A holding force, which included M7 Priest 105mm self-propelled howitzers and tank destroyers, harassed the fortress's occupants for the duration of the battle. On 17 February, the division commenced the formal artillery bombardment of the fortress in preparation for the pending attack. When the time came for them to assault Intramuros, American fire had long since silenced all of the Japanese artillery and mortars within. The 37th Infantry Division outlined its plan for the attack on Intramuros in Field Order 30, which set 23 February as the operation's start date. On the night of 22 February, heavy direct fire weapons and artillery engaged predetermined targets. To the north and east of Intramuros, the 37th Infantry Division placed 12 105 mm and six 155 mm artillery pieces in direct fire positions. Charlie Battery, 544th Field Artillery Battalion, used its massive 240 mm howitzers to breach the north wall and destroy a Japanese strongpoint at the nearby government mint. The 637th Tank Destroyer Battalion also blasted holes in the fortress's northern wall for later exploitation by the infantry. As part of a shaping operation, the 3rd Battalion, 145th Infantry, isolated Japanese troops in the agriculture, finance, and legislative buildings during the night, preventing them from relieving the garrison in Intramuros. At 0730 on 23 February, all of the 37th Infantry Division's artillery and armor initiated a support by fire mission against Intramuros. The division directed its fire against two main points of entry, the Kizon and Parian gates. The heavily barricaded Kizon gate required additional fire from the 145th Infantry's M7 priests. At 0830, the division lifted its fire so that the 145th could attack both identified points of entry. Simultaneously, 3rd Battalion, 129th Infantry, crossed the Pasig River in assault boats and entered the fortress through the breach in the north wall. The U.S. soldiers then battled from building to building as the Japanese defenders recovered from the initial shock of the preparation fire. Although the 129th quickly took control of the fort, it took the rest of the day to subdue pockets of enemy resistance. By nightfall, most of Intramuros lay smoldering. These limited offensive operations were key to consolidating gains. As in Intramuros, 
units conduct variations of a movement to contact, such as a cordon and search, or search and attack, to locate and destroy the remnants of bypassed or defeated enemy forces. This prevents the enemy from prolonging the conflict and hastens the transition to stability. By the morning of 24 February, the Japanese defenders controlled only the south bastion of Intramuros. Protected by a dense minefield and automatic weapons, 115 Japanese troops fought on until a single supporting M7 priest fired into the bastion, permitting an infantry assault to capture it. Finally, Intramuros, the most significant Japanese strongpoint in Manila, fell to U.S. forces. The elation of victory was short-lived. U.S. soldiers witnessed one of the horrors of the Japanese occupation when they found bodies of slaughtered Filipino men stacked five high in the dungeons of Fort Santiago. The capture of Intramuros did not end the struggle to liberate Manila. As U.S. troops cleared Intramuros, the 37th Infantry Division focused on seizing the remaining Japanese strongpoints. U.S. soldiers isolated Japanese defenders in the legislative, capital, finance, and agriculture buildings. These structures were earthquake-proof, in close proximity to one another, and provided mutual fire support. Additionally, wide-open green spaces offered an unobstructed view of all avenues of approach and made exceptional engagement areas. With the fall of Intramuros, the Manila Naval Defense Force's command and control had collapsed, and troops in all four buildings operated with little, if any, leadership. Initially, the 37th Division intended to starve out the Japanese defenders, but they realized that could drag on far too long and impede the consolidation of gains. Instead, the U.S. Army resorted to a proven tactic, massive preparation fire followed by carefully coordinated infantry assaults. On 24 February, the 136th Field Artillery Battalion began a two-day fire mission on the government buildings. On the morning of 26 February, 1st Battalion, 148th Infantry entered the ground floor of the legislative building. Stubborn resistance by the Japanese defenders stalled the American advance and prompted another intense artillery bombardment on 27 February. After two hours, both the north and south wings were in ruin. Clearing efforts commenced shortly thereafter and lasted until midday on the 28th. Sixth Army's ultimate goal was to transfer authority to a restored Philippine Commonwealth government as soon as possible. Despite the ongoing battle, General MacArthur restored the Commonwealth Government of the Philippines on 27 February. The transfer of authority took place at the Malacanang Palace, which had largely escaped damage. Here, roughly 50 years earlier, General MacArthur's father, General Arthur MacArthur, governed the Philippines as an American territory. Now, in the same room used by his father, General Douglas MacArthur proclaimed the restoration of Filipino authority under the Commonwealth government. Meanwhile, the 5th Cavalry Regiment fought for control of the Bureau of Agriculture. There, cavalry troops relied on intense artillery fire to destroy the Japanese strongpoint. The agriculture building soon collapsed, burying the defenders under its rubble. Lost within the debris were the bodies of Rear Admiral Iwabuchi and his staff. They had died by suicide after the fall of Intramuros. Tanks equipped with flamethrowers reduced pockets of resistance, but not until 1 March did the 5th Cavalry secure the building. By 3 March, the U.S. Army controlled the shattered remains of all four government buildings. The battle was finally over. The Battle of Manila left the city in ruins. While some of the city avoided destruction, a third of Manila was badly damaged, and another third was completely destroyed. 
With the capital shattered, the Commonwealth government requested assistance from the U.S. Army to reestablish governance over Manila and the surrounding area. Specifically, President Sergio Osmeña asked General MacArthur to help reconstitute key departments, police, health and welfare, public works, and fire. President Osmeña also requested help with distributing supplies to the beleaguered Filipinos and for civil affairs efforts to continue. With large-scale combat mostly over, General MacArthur and his forces could transition from minimum essential stability tasks to the deliberate execution of stability operations. The Army has six stability operations tasks that serve as a framework for conducting stability operations. Army stability operations tasks serve as lines of effort, or simply as a guide to action, ensuring a broad unity of effort. The human cost of liberating Manila was high. Sixth Army suffered more than 1,000 killed and 5,500 wounded, and the Japanese lost approximately 16,000 troops. An estimated 100,000 civilians perished during the battle. The battle left as many as 200,000 homeless. By 1 April, approximately 60,000 displaced persons were receiving food and shelter from the U.S. Army. Civil affairs housed these individuals in structures that remained standing. Filipino contractors operated under the supervision of civil affairs officers. By 1 May, the number of displaced persons in the direct care of civil affairs units dropped to 37,000, and by June 1945, it was down to only 6,000. With the city's infrastructure largely non-existent, U.S. Army engineers assumed the duties that once belonged to the Department of Public Works. With contracted help from the local population, the engineers erected temporary bridges, repaired the power grid, restored the sewage system, and re-established water services. Restoring electricity to Manila required ingenuity. With Provisor Island destroyed, the city's electrical grid was running off two small diesel-powered electrical plants that had survived the battle. Sixth Army established two more such stations. Additional power came from the USS Wiseman, a U.S. Navy destroyer anchored in Manila Bay, which served as a floating power plant. Despite their efforts, these sources only met 15% of Manila's pre-war electrical demand. The battle left thousands of civilians in desperate need of medical care, and within days, Sixth Army resurrected the Department of Health. Everything from hospital beds to administrative report forms were in short supply. With hospitals damaged during the fighting, civil affairs units supplied and staffed hastily improvised hospitals. Sixth Army assigned select officers to hospital duties, while civil affairs hired Filipino doctors and nurses. By June, the Department of Health controlled 21 hospitals, 10 of which were public. On 1 July, the agency returned the 11 private hospitals to their owners. On 1 August, 6th Army officially transferred the Department of Health to the Commonwealth's Bureau of Health, the same entity that had operated the hospitals before the war. Manila's fire department was not spared during the battle, and most of its vehicles and stations were severely damaged or inoperable. Furnished with American equipment, which included trucks and hoses, U.S. troops trained Filipino firefighters at a newly established academy. Sixth Army also restored telephone lines, established switchboards, and erected three new radio towers. These improvements greatly enhanced communication among emergency services, which improved coordination and response times. Interestingly, over a six-month period, Sixth Army was a major beneficiary of the re-established fire network, as 90% of the major alarms were from U.S. Army installations. Policing remained under Commonwealth control throughout the duration of Manila's recovery. The only law in effect was that of the Commonwealth. Civil affairs did, however, enforce price controls over civilian relief supplies. Since the battle rendered food distribution extremely difficult, Civil Affairs devised a rationing system that controlled costs and stifled the black market, 
while ensuring all Filipinos had access to the basic necessities. For a short period, relief items were given to civilians at no cost. Later, once jobs became less scarce, those who remain unemployed required a certificate from the U.S. Army that stated they were unable to find work. Only then could they receive rations. This prevented the hoarding of essential supplies for sale at higher prices on the black market. Effectively stabilizing an economy requires generating employment opportunities, infusing resources into the local economy, stimulating market activity, fostering recovery through private sector development, and supporting the restoration of physical infrastructure. However, military forces must avoid causing unintended disruptions to the local markets by suddenly stimulating the economy, particularly by agreeing to pay prices significantly above the market rate, as this may cause prices to spike, thus making products cost prohibitive for the population and fueling a black market. In safeguarding Manila's recovering economy, 6th Army helped prevent a black market from undercutting reconstruction efforts. Sixth Army had freed Manila, but at a great cost. When the guns finally fell silent, people scrambled out of their hiding places and started looking for their loved ones. Since there were thousands of decomposing bodies in the streets, there was no recourse but to bulldoze these bodies into big pits that became mass graves. And in those graves lie our doctors and scientists, our architects and engineers, teachers, businessmen, and bright young people murdered in cold blood by maniacal Japanese troops. When the U.S. detonated atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945, the liberation of the Philippines was still incomplete. General Yamashita's Shobu Group had been fighting a war of attrition against 6th Army in northern Luzon. Only with Imperial Japan's unconditional surrender on 15 August did Yamashita's forces end their fight and the U.S. Army complete the liberation of the Philippines. In consolidating gains, 6th Army restored a semblance of order to a city wrought with chaos and prevented the Manila Naval Defense Force from prolonging the conflict. Timely stability operations prevented undue suffering and restored the essential services necessary to hasten a return to normalcy. The rapid transfer of authority was only made possible by close cooperation between the U.S. Army and the Commonwealth Government of the Philippines. And less than a month later, we were back aboard ship and on the way to our next appointment. About the only place left to go in early 45 was Japan itself. We almost made it, Okinawa.